What central theme runs through all the Bible? How would you respond, Jesus, the plan of salvation? The cross, yes to all three, of course, but these three important topics unfold against another all-encompassing theme. The great controversy, this theme pervades the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, the great controversy began in heaven with Lucifer's rebellion against God. At the heart of this cosmic conflict is the issue of God's love. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Whispering Hope Daily Lesson Study Review. Here with us, we are starting a new quarters lesson. Well, this is our first time studying this lesson with our guests here today, and we are on to lesson number two. This quarter, we are studying the great controversy. Our topic for this week is the central issue, love or selfishness. And our topic for this morning, Sunday morning, a broken hearted savior. But before we go into our discussion, we will have our prayer by Elder Curtis and Elder Goodlit will read for us our memory text. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your love and your mercies. We thank you that you are a God of love. You are love, and we can come to you and find all the wonderful blessings that we need to survive, that we need to be saved, that we need, Lord, to go through this wilderness of sin. Help us by your grace, Lord, that as we study your word, that not only us will be blessed this morning, but that all those who join us will be blessed by the study of your word. May we all join and be closely connected and closely knitted with Jesus as we study. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our memory text comes to us from Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10, reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen, amen. So we're going to look at our topic and our subtopic as well as our memory text. So we're going to begin with Elder Curtis and then Elder Goodlate will come right after. Our topic again for this week is the central issue, love or self selfishness. And this morning, a broken-hearted savior. When you look at those topics, what comes to mind? What are we looking at this, this week and this morning? And also share with us what are some insights and main points that stand out to you from our memory text this week. The central issue. The lesson that we are studying, as we all are to be aware, is we are focusing on the great controversy. And the central issue that we are discussing, it has to do with, is it about love? or about selfishness. The Word of God tells us clearly that God is love. And therefore, if God is love, we must understand everything that we read in the Word of God, that we experience from the context of that wonderful love. And that love was demonstrated when the Father, yes, He sent his son. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. So God demonstrates his love and God demonstrates that love through self-sacrificing love toward every one of us in sending Jesus. And so the central issue is not selfishness. Well, selfishness on the part of the enemy of God, but the central issue as we studied, we are going to see that it's all about God's love. God demonstrating love toward us to deliver us. And so as we delve into this theme, this, this memory text, we see that God's love is demonstrated. And God does not want us to be dismayed. He doesn't want us to be fearful. He doesn't want us to, to worry. Even in this world of sin, he wants us to trust rather than to doubt. He wants us to fix our understanding and our minds on the things that he has in store for us and be at peace in our hearts because the God who 
loves us is the God who created us and the God who created us is the God who is saving us. And hence, we don't need to be worrisome. We don't need to be fearful. Even in this world of sin, we can trust God. And so our memory text brings out this reality for us to understand that God will strengthen us as we go forward. God will keep us. He will help us, the text says in Isaiah 41 and verse 10. He will uphold us with his righteous right hand. When? Now. When? We are going through difficulties, whether it is good times or bad times, or God will keep us and he has promised. And I, I, I like what the, the central issue in Sabbath part of the lesson speaks about because Jesus, while he was on earth, he demonstrated that love. And so you and I can be assured that we have a God who cares and he will supply all our needs as we go through this world. Trust him for he is there with us. So when we look at the topic for this week's lesson, the central issue is either love or selfishness. That is what we are focusing on. That is the crux of the matter. This is what it all boils down to. Love, Jesus' unconditional commitment to us imperfect being. He is giving, he is working, he is doing everything for our salvation. And on the other hand, we're going to look at the selfishness, thinking about self-preservation, which is also of the enemy. And so as a result of God giving and working and trying to save us, and we are determined not to be saved. One of the things that I've come to understand is that people are hard to save. And if we look at our own lives, we can see that. And so as we look at this, we see that we have a broken hearted Savior. When, when you will think about what Jesus is doing, when we look at what he's doing to save us and how we are rejecting him, we can see that he is overcome with grief and despair because he knows the end from the beginning. And because of the this, where we are heading in life, he is extremely unhappy about it. He wants to save us from the danger and the difficulties that lie ahead. He wants to redeem us from selfishness and sin. And when we look at the memory text, we can see a summary of all of that. When we look at the, the, the context in which the memory text comes, when we look at Isaiah, in those days, there was a great fear that came upon Judah. Northern kingdom, Israel, was already destroyed by the Assyrians. And this was a mighty army that was coming. And Judah, when they looked, they could not withstand. They could not endure. They could not survive on their own. And therefore, the people at that point in time, they had a great need, a need so for someone to inspire them hope, to give them some hope and comfort. And Isaiah, through his words, God sought to inspire this sort of courage in the people so that they can hold on at the last minute. And so Isaiah, impressed by the Spirit of the Lord, he came to the people and he says, fear not, be not afraid, be anxious for nothing, don't get nervous, don't get discouraged or disheartened, don't be demoralized about your situation. Remember Emmanuel, that is God with us and he has promised that he will never leave nor forsake us. And this message is what they wanted to hear during this time to buoy up their spirit. And so we too, living in these end times, are going to need that kind of message to encourage us as we look at what we can learn from the destruction of Jerusalem. Amen, amen. So we're going to go right into our, our scriptures. We're going to ask Elder Curtis to read for us Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. And Elder Goodlit, Elder Goodlit will read for us Matthew 23, 37 and 38, and John 5, verse 40. And then we'll come right back to our question. Luke 19, 41 to 44, and it reads thus. And when 
he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in all, in every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 and 38, reading from the King James Version, it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And we go now to John chapter 5 and verse 40, and it reads, And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. Amen, amen. And our question here, our first question for our discussion this morning, what do these verses tell you about Jesus' attitude towards his people and their response to his loving invitation of mercy and grace? We'll begin with Elder Curtis and then Elder Goodley. Come right. This text tells me that Jesus' attitude toward his people is all about entreaty entreaty he wants to invite them into a loving relationship so that he could save them it's all about love and you know brothers and sisters we need to understand that based based on what luke 19 41 to 44 tells us he said if they had just known the time of their visitation what would happen to them what would have happened to israel what would have happened to his people as they received him as their savior, that he would have delivered them, that he would have saved them, that he would have caused even all the atrocities that are happening to them. Because at this time, when while Jesus was there, the Roman yoke was upon them and they wanted the Roman yoke to be broken. But because they refused the Messiah, they refused the only hope that they had. And if, if we go back to the theme of what we are studying, the great controversy, we understand that this was it was prophesied that Jesus would have come at this time. The prophecy told us that the, the latter temple would have been greater than the former because what? The Messiah would be there. They would have had the help they needed. The salvation would have come to Israel. But oh, unfortunate, they rejected the only hope that they had. And so we see Jesus with a heart filled with yearning to save his people. We see Jesus with arms open wide and he is truly broken hearted. Why is he broken hearted? He is broken hearted because his people responded with rejection. Generally as a nation, Israel, they rejected the Messiah. They rejected the only one who could have delivered them. You see, they wanted deliverance from the Roman yoke. But Jesus wanted to deliver them, not only from Roman yoke, but also from sin. But they rejected him. And so, my brothers and sisters, the truth be told is, we too are not immune. We are not immune to this reality where we may find ourselves rejecting our only hope. And so, Jesus invites you and I to accept his grace, accept his mercy before it is too late. Satan wants to destroy, but Jesus wants to give us life. Let us not allow ourselves to be caught up in the things of the enemy of God. Walk with me as we string these three texts together. Jesus and his is approaching Jerusalem. And as he approaches, he is over by the, the Kidron Valley, up on the Mount of Olives, and he's looking over at Jerusalem. From this vantage point, you can see the entire city and the temple in all its splendor there. And, and as Jesus looked over it, his heart sunk. Because while we can only see our immediate 
future. They write what is happening now. Jesus can see down the line. And as he looked over Jerusalem, it just calls to mind that he woke up his prophet and he sent them to his people in love. He did all that he could to save his people. And now as he looked over Jerusalem, his time was drawing near and he longed to gather the people under his wing. He longed to protect his people, but he cannot force them. He cannot force them. And therefore, the yearning of his soul for those who he envisioned as he looks down to the future with the destruction of Jerusalem and seeing that he cannot hold them against their will, tears run down his eyes. And he looked and he saw that thousands of of persons, tens of thousands of persons would be killed and going to a Christless graves. And he longed to stop it. But guess what? He cannot. He longed to give them eternal life, but they rejected it and they rebelled against it. But love has to just allow persons to have their own way. So all that Jesus could have done was done. He loved the people. He, his attitude towards it was an attitude of mercy, of loving kindness, of grace, of reaching out day after day, pleading with compassion. He longed to caress them. And therefore, the persons were rejecting his invitation to eternal life, rejecting his grace. He was willing to forgive them, rejecting his mercy. And it broke the heart of our Savior. Are we today breaking the heart of our Savior as they did in Jerusalem? Now, with all that in mind and in light of our first question, what revelation of God's character do you see? What revelation of God's character do you see? The revelation of God's character that I see from these texts, I see what Peter talks about. Um, in is it first Peter, second Peter three, verse nine, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us. One, I see the long suffering of God, I see the love of God, I see the compassionate God yearning for a wayward people. I see where the Bible tells us in John 1 11 that he, he, he came to his own, but his own received him not. I see him willing to do everything necessary to deliver a people. I see him yearning. What one, one preacher calls him the, the hound of heaven. He will come after you. He will come after me. He will do everything to save me. He's not willing that any should perish, the word of God tells us, but that all should come to repentance. It therefore tells me that the character of God as this demonstrated to Moses, that God is long-suffering, is merciful, is compassionate, is tender-hearted towards his wayward children. And I know that somebody out there watching even this morning, somebody even throughout the rest of the day, even coming on the, the, the channel sometime, even after today, and they watch this, they might be thinking that they are too far gone for God to save them. But I want you to understand that God loves you and he wants to save you and he's, he, he does not give up on you. You are the one who may want to give up on God, but God doesn't give up on you. He is he's with outstretched arm, willing to take you back as messy, as dirty as you might think you are. And yes, we, you and I, we can make God happy again. Yes, because just as oh, even although they, as Israel as a nation rejected him, the disciples, faulty as they may be, they stuck with him. And I believe just like Peter, when, when Jesus was resurrected, he says to St. Mary, tell the disciples and Peter, yes, and you and me, that he's alive and he loves you. He loves me and he's coming to save us. Yes, my brothers and sisters, he is a loving and compassionate God. Amen. As Jesus looked down the annals of time and what he saw broke his, his heart, yet still, unselfishly, he still gave of himself. He, he still tried to reach. And so we see the, as Ella Curtis said, the, the long suffering of God. We see that he is not willing that any should perish and therefore he is on a 
quest for restoration of these individuals. And when I look at what Jesus has done, remember, this is the is very God. And he looked and he saw that Jerusalem would be destroyed. He saw that many would not make it. And therefore, in love, in mercy, he extended grace. He, he, he extended the time. He longed to step in and to deliver his people. But as we can see, the major character of God that is demonstrated here is love. You see, for love to be love, it must be free. It cannot be coerced. God could not coerce the people against their will. He had to have respect unto their decision. And despite the fact that it broke his heart, he still had to allow the people's decision to be final. That is what only love can do. And we today are also recipients of that love. And God, we, we need to understand that God is unselfish. We see the unselfish side of God. We see the gracious side of God because despite we are sinners and the wages of sin is death, I give thee thanks for the but the gift of God is eternal life. And so God is gracious towards us. He's gracious towards the people because he still kept sending prophets after prophets, warning after warning, even after his death, warning after warning, leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. And so we can say, thank God for his love that is still being demonstrated to us today. He still wants to gather us under his wing, protection, shielding us from the evil one that would really want to do us harm. I can't, I can't even imagine where I would be or where some of us would be if God did not shield us. Yes, a few things may touch us, but if God did not shield us, I have no clue as to where we would be. Amen, amen. So, Ella Curtis, we're going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 20. And the question here is, what instruction did Jesus give to his people to save them from the coming destruction of Jerusalem. When he therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. What a wonderful God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, as I read these texts, one sees again where despite the rejection that Jesus received, he is such a loving, merciful, compassionate God that he would send for his people, those who would, who would accept him, a word of caution, a word of, let me put it this way, to prepare them for what is about to come. You see, Picture it, AD 31, Jesus is about to die. And Jesus is preparing a people for what is about to come. AD 34, Stephen is murdered. The disciples, they went into an experience of persecution. And a couple years after that, a few years after that, AD 66, Cestius, yes, the Roman general, he besieged the city of Jerusalem. And guess what? Because Jesus would have prepared them, they would have been equipped. They would have been looking for the signs. And that is why I tell people, you know, it's when you see prophecies start coming true. It is time for you to get ready. When you see things are happening in the world that tells us that the coming of Christ is near, we need to watch the sign. We need to obey the instructions given. And so the disciples Disciples, when Cestius besieged the city without any, for want of a better word, with unknown reason, he withdrew and the Christians saw in the skies, they saw signs, they saw a, an opportunity for them to leave Jerusalem. And brothers and sisters, those who are listening, I want you to understand that according to Josephus, the Jewish historian, the Christians, they because the Jews 
attacked in the, the Roman army and the Roman army had withdrew. The Christians found an opportunity to leave Jerusalem, leave the city. And so not one Christian, not one Christian was caught up when Titus came back AD 70 and destroyed Jerusalem. And so this is the message. As you read Matthew 24, 15 through to 20, read Jesus giving us today also the warning that when we see things start to happen, we need to move, move according to the word of God. Because it is when we move according to what Jesus tells us, that we are going to be protected because even in the midst of rejection, Jesus is still showing pastoral care. He's still showing that he loves his children. He still wants to deliver. And you and I can be protected too when we heed the word of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, when we look at it, you know, it says the instruction that did, what instruction did Jesus give his people to save them from the coming destruction of Jerusalem as Ella Curtis just, just walked us through. When we look at it, is that Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealed his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. And so from in the Old Testament, God has been sending messages to the people that, listen, we must always be in a state of readiness as God's people. We must not hold to anything earthly that will cause us to lose our salvation. And he even pulled on the thing and said, remember Lot's wife. And so as we read through Matthew chapter 24, 15 to 20, it speaks to the abomination of desolation, which happened when the armies came about. That means you must be ready to move at a moment's notice. So what happened now is that, listen, if you are out in the field, don't come back for your passport or your bank book. Don't come back for your stocks or your bonds. Don't come back for your Gucci handbag. Leave it if you're on, in your, on the house stop as near as it is. Flee the city. Run. Don't worry about if you will have hyped water. Don't worry about if you will have any KFC or Burger King. Don't worry about if the ATMs up there work or whatsoever. Listen to me. Flee. God says to leave it. Many persons because of material things. These warnings that God is given, because we are so caught up with it, just like the Jews, we will not be able to see the signs of the times and know when God is telling us to leave. He says, ensure, pray, pray. This is it. No, no. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, because when it is in the winter, you're moving around in mud, mud and it's going to be difficult for you to maneuver. Your heart may be breaking. It's difficult to find things, shelter or things to eat or something like that. But despite that, if it push come to shove, God will provide. And he says, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath as well, because when it comes to Sabbath, we must always remember the sacredness and the sanctity of the Sabbath. This excitement and all of these things to run. When you look at it, when you dig deep into the text, the Jews, they would view it as a desecration of the Sabbath because they would like to come together and worship. And so the same warning that Jesus gave to them is the same thing he is giving to us in order to save us from the coming destruction. That we must be vigilant. We must always be ready. Our loins gird and our shoes and our feet, feet ready to move, to leave everything for Jesus. Because guess what? When you have lost everything and Jesus is the only one you have, you will find out that Jesus is the only one you really need. Amen, amen, amen. Our last question for this morning, our, our lesson asks us to reflect on the following statement. We do not judge God's character by events we see around us. Rather, we filter all the events we see through the prism of his loving character as revealed in the Bible. Why is this such good counsel? When we have a tendency to look at things 
through the events, what we find is that sometimes we are left broken and disheartened. Why? Because we can't see a loving God carrying out certain acts, destroying men and women, destroying children, destroying all the antediluvian. We, we can't see destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. We, we can't see, and many persons have walked away from God because they are viewing God through events, not through love. But when we start to look at God, at the, the events, through the prism of the loving character of God, then we start to see something different. For instance, many persons, it's hard for them to, to see God destroying this earth with so many persons being destroyed. But when we start to look at it, through the eyes of a loving God, we see a new picture. We see that if a man decides that he is going to hold on to sin, it would be a punishment to keep him through eternity in that mode. Imagine somebody going through eternity. You don't love God and you can't carry out a sinful act. You will be miserable. So even the destruction of the wicked, when we look at it through God's eyes, it is an act of mercy. Many times we are praying for persons to get healing and the person, God in his wisdom, puts that person to sleep. And many persons get upset how they have been praying, praying, and God has put that person to sleep. But we don't, we are not feeling the pain that the person is going through. We are not feeling the torment that the person is going through. We are not enduring that. But God in his wisdom and mercy puts that person to sleep at that time is also an act of mercy. And so when we start to look at things through the eyes of God, we take a different perspective. We start to see things as how God sees it and know that nothing good will God withhold from his people. And every good and perfect gift comes down from above. And while we are going through our tribulation, God is going to be with us. When we start to look at it through God's eye, when we start to take that counsel, then we will view things in a different light. We will see it as how God intended us to see it. Amen. Amen, Elder. And, and it is so important that we appreciate this reflection statement that we do not judge God's character by events because many events we experience may give us a wrong impression of who God truly is. But when we see God through love, through his wonderful, merciful character, then we understand better that it is not God who brings destruction, it is sin that brings destruction. And the cause, the root cause of sin is disobedience. And the first one to have disobeyed was Satan. And so we, we need to put the blame where the blame truly ought to go. And brothers and sisters, we need to understand that when our loved ones get sick, it's because of sin and Satan. When our loved ones die, it's because of sin and Satan. When bad things happen, it's not because of God, it's because of sin and Satan. And so when we place the blame where the, the blame really needs to be placed, then we understand that, oh, it is not God, but it is because of sin. And now the beautiful thing is this. Sin separates us from God. But when we are united back to God, then we understand that God is love. And then when we understand that God is love and we are connected to God, we understand that death is just temporary. Yes, it's just a pause because eternity is provided for all those who submit themselves to God. Even when we get sick and God permits us to, to die, it's just for a, a short while. And that is why when we even pray for persons, my brothers and sisters, and persons are sick and they don't get well, we must be more concerned about the person's soul salvation than even the person getting well. And so we need to see events. We, we need to filter events from the prism of God's love. And when we see God's love and we understand God's love, we will understand that even as Elder Goodlett says, the destruction of the wicked will be an act of love because 
anyone who is willing to live a life of sin and die knowing that Christ provided salvation. It means that if you give that person an eternity, they are willing to reject Christ eternally and die in their sin. But if we accept Christ and we live for Christ, then we understand that it's because of that love. Oh, love that will not let me go. I will rest my weary soul in thee. I give the, back the life I own. And so we need to understand things from the perspective of the loving God. And when we do that, when we do that, then everything starts to make sense. Everything starts to give the, the correct energy. We don't go around in life worrying or fretting or, or in despair because we know that a God of love loves us and he wants to save us. And it doesn't matter what happens to us, my brothers and sisters, as long as we are surrendered to God, he will make everything right. Amen, amen. And that has brought us to the end of our discussion. And it's time for our takeaway. And not only what we take away from our lesson today, but what is your expectation for our quarter's lesson on the Great Controversy? So we'll begin with Elder Goodlett and then Elder Curtis will wrap up for us. Share with us your takeaway from today's lesson and what you expect in the quarter that we've just begun. Takeaways from this lesson is that God is a God of love and his desire is to save us. Bad things are going to happen, but God has warned us in advance. So therefore, when we see evil things happening around us, be not dismayed or discouraged. These are not coming from God. These are coming from the enemy. And the enemy has only one intention, and that is to separate us from God and to have us die eternally. But God is determined to save us. And the only way we cannot be saved is if we are determined to be lost. I pray by God's grace that we will not, in the end, break the heart of our loving Savior, our Redeemer, who has paid the ultimate price to redeem us from sin. And as we go through the, this quarter's lesson, what I am looking for is a better understanding and an applicable way of going through the theme of the great controversy, that the veil will be removed from many more eyes. And we as a people will truly see where we are and what is happening. And we will all make our calling and election sure. For me, I am anticipating a wonderful study. Amen. A wonderful study. Anytime we touch the great controversy, and the, the beautiful thing is the book, um, written by Sister White, Ellen G. White, The Great Controversy. We have a number of chapters uh, that are given for us to read. And to me and for me, I see myself, and I hope those who are watching on YouTube will see themselves, that we are all in this great controversy. It's a battle for you and I. And it's a battle in our minds also. And you and I, we are all making decisions either for God or against God. And those around us are being impacted by our decisions because what decision I make and the life that I live will impact those around me to either make decisions for God or against God. And the truth be told is when I make decisions for God, yes, there are going to be some families, some friends, who are going to reject and who are going to push back at me. When I make decisions for God, I'm going to have persons in my family who will be embracing my move towards the things of God. The truth be told is we are all in this great controversy. And I want to encourage somebody to allow Jesus in their heart, in their lives, and to watch Isaiah, yes, watch Isaiah, our memory text, Isaiah 41 verse 10, being fulfilled in our lives where we are not to be dismayed. For God is with us. He is our God. He will strengthen us. Yes, he will help us. He will uphold us with the right hand of his, his righteous right hand. And as he carries us through this great controversy, I want somebody to recognize that, yes, there is help to defeat the enemy. There is help to overcome sin. 
there is help. There is help available. So, and we can know the future. Hallelujah. We can know the future and be ready now to live for Jesus. And thank you for coming. God bless you. Amen. 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 And that has brought us to the end of our discussion this morning. We're glad that you could have joined us and been a part of our study. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning when our topic will be Christians Providentially Preserved. So share the link with a family, share the link with a friend, and join us as we continue to study together.